Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. My name is Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and this is the web's talk show about Gnosticism, the esoteric, the occult, mysticism, and anything else we feel like talking about. I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Memo. Hello, Jason. Hello there. And uh, awesome guest. I always say that, but it's always true. Uh, and uh, that's why we're such an awesome show. Uh, and I, I don't think we're an awesome show because of me, uh, or even necessarily because of Jason or anybody else. It's just that we have incredible, incredible guests. So exactly. we have Karen Weaver from uh, AJC, uh, St. Mary Magdalene uh, Parish in Denver, Colorado, who's going to be speaking to us about the Divine Feminine. Hello, Karen. Hi there. Um, before we, we dive into a topic that I know many of you out there are fascinated by, and I'm almost apologetic that it's taken us almost a decade to do this show, <laughs> when we first had to do a little bit of business where I had to do a commercial for our Patreon. Because I hate doing this and hate asking for money, but it's very important, I'm going to try to do it as fast as possible. Even though every time I try this, I, it actually gets slower. So Jason, are, are you ready with the timer? I am ready. Okay. I'll give you a countdown here. Three, two, one, go. Talknosis is brought to you by viewers and listeners like you. We need your financial support to actually be able to do the show. You can do so by going to paypal.com slash Gnostic. You can donate for as little as a piece, uh, dollar per piece of media per month. You can cap that in case we do a whole bunch of media. You can also do one-time donations at paypal.com slash Gnostic. If you're unable to help us out financially, we completely understand. You can help us out by subscribing on YouTube, leaving uh, good reviews on the podcatcher of your choice, telling people about the show, sharing the show on social media, taking your favorite episode, and just emailing it to a friend. Uh, uh, we need money. I hate asking for money, but money makes the world go around. It's the worst of the archons. Uh, the please, a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, the end. How'd I do? Thirty-nine that seconds. <sighs> Thirty-nine. Well, you know, let's see the record. Thirty-eight <laughs> seconds, Karen. Oh, geez. So, oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> but last time you got even. You got to like no. a minute. So yeah, yeah. Last time it was like ten minutes long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey. Time to actually do what we're here for. Karen, why is the divine feminine important? And, and isn't God beyond gender? So I have a couple of theories on that. And the first is that while the pleroma is non-gendered and union, the um, God, we have the three emanations, of course, of God in uh, Gnostic Christianity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And while God is often referred to as the Father, that's more of the union, the genderless part, and then emanates as the Logos and as Sophia, the Word and Wisdom. And also, um, we need polarity in the universe, the positive and the negative. And it might be easier to think that of that as yang and yin, and so these positive and negative polarities create motion in the universe. And without those polarities, everything would be stagnant and unmoving. Very cool. And so would you say that these polarities that, that really, for humans to kind of understand them, do we, do we throw the gender labels on them so we can, our, 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 our brains trying to grapple with concepts that can't be put into words are, are able to understand it? Is it something like that? Yes, and I think it makes us easier to see ourselves in the divine if there is a more of a gendered, masculine, feminine spectrum aspect to the divine. Yeah. Um, so the divine feminine um, seems to be either missing or incredibly downplayed for, you know, more or less to the last 2,000 years or, mo <laughs> or more in mainstream Christianity and in another yeah. sort of like Western uh, uh, forms of, of religion. Like, why? Well, and I honestly think that it has to do with the descent cycle and this idea of we are in this world but not of it. And to quote, um, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, our world was generally seen as a bad idea um, or a mistake, if you will. But I don't know. I think there's a lot of beauty here and the divinity coming in 
to matter, as the Gospel of Thomas puts it, um, a miracle of miracles. And from the time that I was, you know, yay high, um, there was a poem by um, William Blake, Auguries of Innocence, that's just stuck with me. I had a t-shirt when I was in junior high that had the first four lines of the poem on it, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. And I think there's a lot of beauty here and a lot of lessons to be learned and that this descent cycle of spirit coming into matter that is more seen as being aided by Sophia has become devalued, something to escape, something that's a prison, something that we need to ascend from. Yeah, um, and of course, William Blake, a, a great Gnostic visionary, uh, somebody who, yeah, who, who actually constructed his own Gnostic mythos, uh, both from, from esoteric influences and from his own experiences. And that's a poem mm -hmm. that's always touched me as well. One of my first yeah. plays when I was a playwright was, was called, uh, um, i trying to remember the title, but it was something like, it was a quote from him, the world in a grain of sand or world's mm -hmm. grain of sands or something. It was, it was my own spin upon the, the line. So, uh, yeah. but yes, also, also very moving for me. And uh, I think that's, that's a great explanation. Um, so, yes. oh, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Sorry. Just to kind of dive in there too, is that, so I think like, I think you get, you, you kind of created a good space for us to look at, um, uh, like the 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 usefulness or the the validity of, of, of that perspective, but I think the, the flip side of it is that like it, is there something that maybe that people have been afraid of or have been unwilling to grapple with that is that is why we're not seeing it or why we haven't seen historically as much engagement with uh, with a divine feminine perspective? I'm not sure of that exactly. For me, thinking of it more in yin and yang is a bit easier and the yin is always hidden. The yin is always supportive. And I think that especially in recent years, especially the yin, the traditional, the traditional role of women has been very devalued. And sometimes even by women themselves, um, women, a lot of women today, especially want to move more into the masculine, more into the active, more into the out there. And I think that this traditional role of femininity, of women, there's a, there's a lot of confusion there and mistaking archetypes for identity. And so if, so for an example, a lot of women that I've talked to, if the archetypes of the feminine don't fit exactly with their lives or where they want their lives to go, then it's just kind of pushed aside and made more as um, invalid and devalued. But the health of women is the health of society. And what I mean by that is that there used to be these cunning women who passed knowledge of the household, knowledge of healing, knowledge of herbalism, um, knowledge of health, of family, of teaching. And these cunning women used to pass those along to their daughters. And that's not, I don't think it's seen as, Im, as important, especially in modern times, which is sad in my opinion. That actually leads into my next question, although it's a bit wider than specifically what you're talking about, but mm -hmm. has the, the sort of lack and, and hole uh, that, that's caused by the missing divine feminine in mainstream religion have have had bad consequences for people? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I believe so. And I mean, of course, we had, um, there were, you know, the witch trials and the um, Inquisition, although some people have really belittled the role of the Inquisition in these, um, in the past witch hunts and witch trials. However, I think we need to look at the, um, the deeply religious culture of the time. And it was seen as scary. I mean, a woman would go 
into this cunning woman's home um, pregnant and then come out and not be pregnant anymore. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was the herbal knowledge. And I think also, and I'm not sure how to really put this, but the hidden the hidden and the support structures oftentimes can be scary and can be seen as maybe even possibly potentially taking over. And of course, um, they say, you know, what do men in power want? They want more power. And so to have this community outside of the church, to have these communities of women running the households, running the families, doing all of this very important supportive work, that was, you know, competition, especially for land, especially for money. And I think that that may have been a factor. Yeah. Um, what might be seen as a, as a leading question, uh, is the divine feminine important in Gnosticism? <laughs> I think the divine feminine is very important in Gnosticism. It'd be really funny if you had said no. <laughs> no, and no, said no, 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 no further comment. Next no question. comment. No comment. <laughs> can you yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? About why and yes. how it's important? And um, and especially in the Johannite tradition, um, to be Johannite is often seen as being Marian. Mm. So when Jesus was on the cross. Um, there were three Marys and John who stayed, who stayed beneath the cross. And it was Mary, his mother, Mary, his sister, who we think we know who that was, but of course it's uncertain, and also the Magdalene. And in the New Revised Standard Version in John uh, 19, chapters 26 through 27, um, it states, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing behind her, beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Hmm. And I think that that was the birth of modern Western esoterica, because all of the current um, esoteric lodges are dedicated to the Holy Saints John. And of course, what they value more than anything is this idea of charity and taking care of the widows and the orphans. And that to me is a big part of the divine feminine. And also in Gnosticism, we have of course, Mary Magdalene who went from, well, where she's named specifically is um, Jesus expelled seven demons from her. And of course, the number seven has many, many meanings. Mm -hmm. um, and then she also became very close, especially in the Gnostic scriptures. Um, her voice had merit. Her voice had weight. And for those old Jewish communities, I mean, that was revolutionary. For Jesus even to be talking to her, to be teaching her, to allow her to teach as well, as we see in the Pistis Sophia as they're going through all of the Psalms, to have her be a voice, to have her be a mirror um, for the other disciples, I think is very, very powerful. Yes, exactly. And it, yes, it would have been very controversial in many, many traditional cultures, as well as many living cultures. Yes. To this day, you can't be in public uh, alone with, with a woman that you're not related to, let yes. alone, of course, traveling around the entire country, you know, with her as, as an important part of your entourage as a, as a fellow teacher, right? That would yes. have been um, yes. so that, that would have just blown people's minds just to even see have. that in public. Yes, it would have, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the, again, leads quite well into uh, the uh, next question. Uh, how do you understand Mary the mother and Mary Magdalene? And, and feel free to talk as long as you want. And I ask that question mm -hmm. because, you know, some modern Gnostics um, 
see Mary the mother as uh, as an incarnated Sophia or see Mary Magdalene as an incarnated Sophia. Um, yes. And, you know, you can speak about the, your own personal views as well as, as what you see in the tradition. Yes, absolutely. So in our parish, um, we wrote a, um, a liturgy, but I guess we can't really call it a liturgy since there's no Eucharist service. in it. <laughs> yes. So it's a service, it's a ceremony, this uh, divine feminine ceremony. And we talk about Eve, um, Mary, the Virgin Mary, and Mary Magdalene as three different emanations of Sophia, almost in the pagan maiden mother crone mm -hmm. idea. So we have Eve, the Sophia, as the incorruptible virgin, since there's that story that, you know, the archons uh, sent, or the demiurge sent archons to molest um, Eve, and she turned herself into a tree. Mm -hmm. And since there were only two trees in the Garden of Eden, Eve would have been the tree of life. Yeah. And then um, the mother Mary, as the Sophia and Theotokos who birth God into the world as the Logos, as the word, as God made flesh. And then we also talk about Mary Magdalene as the Sophia and consort. And she's often called the apostle to the apostles, but we have an icon in our parish that was written by um, uh, Father William McNichols. And he wrote on there, Mary Magdalene equal to the apostles, which I love. And he was a Je he's a Jesuit priest. And so to even have that icon from him is just, I think, really cool. Yeah, and Apostle to the Apostles, you do hear that title in the mainstream church, and it's mm -hmm. right there, and, you know, we don't need uh, any funky hidden uh, manuscripts that were discovered in the Egyptian deserts. Nope. It's right there in the canonical <laughs> Bible. That's, that's who Mary Magdalene yes, is. is. Yeah, the yes. Apostle to the Apostles. And first risk, and uh, first witness to the resurrected Christ. Exactly. Um, do you... The, Sometimes uh, the, in the AJC, uh, it's sort of a, a funny term, uh, we've talked about waving the Gnostic wand. So, <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is um, our, our forefathers and foremothers uh, in the tradition, uh, when the Gnostic church came back in, in the 1800s, they really took a lot of specifically Mother Mary holidays um, yes. and symbolism and sort of waved the Gnostic wand over them and said, these are now Sophia holidays and uh, Sophia practices. Uh, do you think that, that, and I think that's interesting, and, and I think there's some validity there, so I'm not completely critical of it, but, but do you think maybe we lost something or, or perhaps our, our forebears went a little too far by, by really taking away the emphasis from Mother Mary? I do because it's missing some of the human element there, I believe. And there are some very interesting stories, especially, um, you know, apocryphal stories written after the canon of Mother Mary and, you know, her, um, her golden girdle that she gave to Thomas in some stories as she ascended and also, um, that ended up with Mary Magdalene and has ties back to Isis and her um, her uh, golden girdle. And so I think it takes some of the humanness out of it and also an enlightenment aspect out of it. Because if we, if we keep it as the Virgin Mary, who is one of the ascended masters, um, then I think it adds a human element and also the capability for all of us to also reach this enlightenment state almost in a Buddhist way. Yeah, I th yeah, I, I find that very interesting because sometimes in the the high church tradition, there's kind of this idea that that God just chose Mary and that's why she's special. But I really like uh -huh. that idea of her being an enlightened sage, and that's what sort of makes her worthy of, of being the Theotokos, right? Uh, so yes. she's equally, you know, she's someone who spent perhaps her youth in meditation and prayer, you know, had breakthroughs mm -hmm. that that are equal to to Jesus. Um, 
the, the 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 one of the the most recent shows uh, that we've done on Talk Gnosis is, was called uh, "What Jesus Learned from Women," and uh, um, uh, talking about the a new book with that title, and. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, the highly recommended, an amazing book by, by Dr. James McGrath. And on that show as well, I had Dr. Sarah Parks on talking about her work and we talked about all the work together. Anyways, mm -hmm. he has an amazing chapter in that where he, he, you know, where of course he sort of has to do a lot of extrapolating from texts and, and sometimes extra canonical texts. But he has a whole chapter about what Jesus learned from Mary uh, as a religious teacher yes. uh, from his mother. Uh, and and what what insights into the divine she must have passed on to him uh, to help him become such an amazing uh, teacher. So yeah, I think that's yeah. very interesting and, and and something that's often lacking. And and we do find that in some of the extra canonical literature. You know, there's stories about Jesus, uh, sorry, Jesus Mary being raised in the temple and being mm -hmm. particularly devout and having particular insights into into the nature of reality. And then we find that. Um, Later too, there's 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 some some extra canonical texts that take place after the crucifixion when she's in the household of John, um, where where her and John are sort of uh, teaching each other. So, uh, Jason, go ahead. So yeah, just to just to jump in on a couple of a couple of thoughts that have been rolling around while I've been listening here is um, uh, one that I think the uh, that idea of uh, of uh, Mary Magdalene having this uh, mystical aspect and this like sort of uh, we were talking even about like a um, similar to a Buddhist aspect that uh, reminds me of Houston Smith's, uh, I think, quote about Gnosticism was that it was a Western path towards Asia um, in terms of approaching a similar kind of mindfulness or or um, unattachmentness that that wasn't that wasn't being provided by other forms of spirituality. And that was this was sort of like in an almost Joseph Campbellian sense, this is how it was manifesting in, in sort of Western, Western culture, which I think is a fascinating idea. Yeah. Um, but then what I what it also kind of connects me to, or what it makes me wonder about. So I'm leading to an actual question here: is um, uh, if if that is also part of what uh, what what the appeal for uh, a divine feminine is, is that it's a way of approaching some of these Gnostic experiences that is missing or like, sorry, not, not missing, is bereft of maybe some of the more sort of masculine imperialistic baggage that has come from some of the more uh, um, uh, strongly defined uh, uh, spiritual moments. Like you do these yeah. things in these ways and this is the one way you get something versus mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I think I'm kind of rambling. I'll, I'll let you take it off there, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna ramble a little bit as well. Um, so that kind of brings me to the ideas of the Silk Road. Now the Silk Road was not just a trade route, but also exchanges of knowledge and exchanges of culture and the sharing that would have happened along these trade routes. And that also leads me to some very similarities even not only with um, the Egyptian faiths but also with the Hindu faiths as well and there are two missing sacraments that we do not really know much about anymore and that's the sacraments of the bridal chamber and of chrism of anointed of anointing and of course, even the term Christos means anointed or consecrated one. And that's another thing that I love about this icon um, by Father Bill, that it shows Mary Magdalene holding the vessel as a crucible with the pearl of wisdom on top. And then she has her hand up in a blessing kind of a way. And then all you see in one of the corners is a stigmatic foot. Mm. So Mary Magdalene is making the consecration happen that is the Christos. And that brings me to the link in, um, in Hinduism as well of the Kundalini. As the Kundalini ascends through the chakras to the crown of the head, the feeling is said to be of oil pouring out over the top of the head in this anointing fashion. And so there are some similarities and I don't think it's coincidence. I mean, there's stories 
of um, Joseph and Mother Mary um, retreating to Egypt after Jesus's birth to escape, you know, the killing of the young children. And then again, as I mentioned, there's the Silk Road as well, and also stories of, you know, what happened to Jesus from the time he was five to the time he was 33. You know, so there's, there are a lot of possibilities there, and there are a lot of similarities of, of uh, tales and of myths and of different religions and different practices. Yeah. And like if you Google the, the Leviticon, our, our received uh, Gnostic uh, Joanite, more Joanite version of the, the Gospel of John, a mysterious yes. text that arrived and that was rediscovered in the 1800s. Um, mm -hmm. if you, the first thing that happens if you Google it is that it's, it, it's, you will get a lot of hits that say that the, the text uh, says that Jesus was, was an initiate of ISIS. Now, <laughs> now the Leviticon doesn't <laughs> actually say that. Um, uh, it's really funny that people think that, but it does say you that I can't remember the exact quote and if somebody does know it please correct me but of course he's teaching and uh, his opponents uh, say something like oh did he did, did he learn this in Egypt uh, who is yeah. he to come with all Egyptian knowledge and to to push it on to us with a little yeah. bit of paraphrasing so that got extrapolated <laughs> to while he was in Egypt he was uh, initiated into the cult of Isis but the, the, you know that is in our tradition and you know the, the Leviticon is a very interesting text and uh, we also have um, stuff from uh, from people who didn't like the Christians um, from their opponents uh, in the, the in the in the second century saying that uh, you know picking up the story of a Jesus studying in Egypt and stealing all of his ideas from Egypt. So there are there are sources that, that make this claim so that we can extrapolate from there. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Something else that's cool, Karen, uh, that that I'll I'll send you if, if you're not familiar with it, I'll, and I'll try to I'll try to put it in in the show notes. Whenever someone mentions mentions Kundalini, the heresiologists did mention that, that there was a Gnostic sect that that believed that um, you know enlightenment and the connection to the divine comes through a meditative practice where energy is brought up from the lower part of the body up the spine and united within the center of the brain. So, uh, yes. which is, so the, this is a practice, uh, a technique that, that ancient Gnostics did do. We, we have the records yes. and the heresiologists and that sounds very similar to Kundalini. Yes. And also the light body exercises from Druidry yes. where you draw up the energy from the earth and it starts to light you up from your feet all the way up out through the top of your head. Yes, precisely. Sounds very familiar. <laughs> exactly. And uh, and for those who, who don't know as well, Kundalini um, is often uh, coded as female. So yes. it's sometimes called a goddess. Uh, the energy uh, is, is sometimes understood as a goddess. It's often referred to in, in, in feminine ways. So Yes. Yeah, very, very akin to Sophia's wisdom. Yes, precisely. Yes. And, and associated with snakes as well. So also yes. another connection the with serpent. wisdom. Yeah, serpent, Sophia. Yes. So uh, the re really fascinating stuff, which really does make me think that that, that these ancient cultures uh, were in touch with each other, but also mm -hmm. they were they were having similar experiences. And, yes. you know, you're going to talk about it in the same language. Mm -hmm. um, so you're a member of uh, uh, the AJC, the Joanite Church's uh, Chivalric Order, which is the yes. Order of the Temple and St. John, the OTSG. Now, yes. now if we talk about chivalry and knights, you know, if I say the word knight, uh, people yeah. are going to have a very masculine image in their mind, right? Uh, you know, swords Absolutely. and shields and duels. <laughs> so isn't this stuff pretty male? Is, is there room for the divine feminine chivalry? I believe so. Um, but there is some history there. Um, of course, Bernard of Clairvaux um, wrote the original rule for the Templars. And at that time, it was very much forbidden for the Templar Knights to associate with women, um, to kiss women, even their mothers. Um, but that didn't last very long. Um, and also Bernard of Clairvaux had some very interesting ideas about the masculine and feminine and the projection the, project, the projective and the receptive aspects. And he saw it much in the same way as like the Native Americans see it, um, whereas the masculine is projective in the physical, but receptive in the spiritual. And the feminine is receptive in the, fem in the 
spirit in the physical, but projective in the spiritual. And you can see in the, yes, in the spiritual. And you can see that in the Native American dances um, where the women's movements are very small and controlled and they're dreaming a dream up into the ether. And then the masculine, the male dances are very elaborate and pounding and jumping around. And then the drummers are just beating all that into the earth. And to bring that back to knighthood and the Templars, um, there were of course one-offs um, of female knights. And you see that later as well with say Joan of Arc and some other um, uh, Chinese warrior queen figures, but where the feminine really shined in the Templar orders, such as the Hospitallers and the Cistercians, was in the caretaking, was in the healing, was in the medicine. And so there we go back again to these, um, that the health of the women is the health of the society. And it was the women who were really behind the scenes, keeping everyone healthy, keeping everyone taken care of, keeping everyone clothed, keeping everyone fed. And, and I, that was very valuable. And you see that in many cult, in some cultures today as well, um, the Amish really come to mind where the work of the women behind the scenes is seen as very valuable, very respected. And, it what, and it's what keeps the families going. It's what keeps the communities going. And I believe it was the same with the Templars, that the women were, were keeping everyone healthy, keeping everyone together, keeping um, everyone safe behind the scenes. Yeah. So we've already touched on this uh, a, a little bit, um, but uh, you're also involved with some some other spiritual uh, traditions uh, that, um, uh, how do they inform your relationship with the divine feminine? So when I, so when I was growing up, um, my family was not very particularly religious and I only went to a Christian church a handful of times and it was, not the best experience of that time. And when I met my husband, Monsignor Bray Weaver, um, he actually taught me and got me in touch with um, a lot of pagan teachers, Wiccan teachers, shamanic teachers. And that was really my foundation for the sacred feminine. And I have to tell you, when I wrote our uh, divine feminine ceremony, um, with our parish, it was very hard to keep it in the Christian mythos because I did have a big background in goddesses and in these very strong female archetypes. And one that really jumps to mind is, of course, Kali. And I think that Kali, even today, is quite misunderstood. Um, She's kind of a, she's a very fearsome figure with, uh, you know, the garland of letters as the skulls around her neck. And um, I often joke kind of how some people joke about Monsignor Bray and that if you asked her as the mama bear um, or mama wolf um, for anything that was in her power, she would grant it to you. But if you tried to take it from her, or take it from her children, then she'd probably add your head to her collection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and some of the funny, well, not so much funny, but some of the interesting symbolism in many of the statues of Kali is she's holding her tongue between her teeth. And that's been kind of seen as a coy maneuver because to stop her rampage against the demons, her husband, one of the aspects of Shiva, laid down beneath her so that she would step on him, which in the Hindu culture is very, very rude. Mm -hmm. um, to touch anything with your feet is very rude. And so it was kind of seen like an oops, a coy maneuver. But what it has to go back to are these three gunas, these three qualities that um, are very important to keep in balance. 
And sattva, the more spiritual aspect, is the color white of her teeth. And then the rajas, this fire, this passion that was out of control is symbolized by the red and of her tongue. And then, of course, the tamas is seen as, as dark, as black, but it's also our recovery time, um, our sleep time. And so to bring all those into balance, um, I believe the, um, the Ayurvedic um, aspects of that culture is very compatible with the Gnostic Christian ideas of the feminine and trying to keep all of these aspects of ourselves in balance and in check and being more beneficial rather than detrimental. Yeah, um, that reminds me and uh... Um, often guests will say stuff. I was like, "Oh, geez, I really need to do a show on that." And, and of course, <laughs> now, uh, now you've given me three because uh, now we have to do a show on Blake, uh, uh, Jason. Yes. Jason, we we have to do a uh, a show about um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as an Gnostic text. Done. We'll have to do this. <laughs> yep. And then the third would be a, a show on Saint Sarah the Egyptian, who is actually known um, by the Roma people as Saint Sarah the Kali. Uh, because yes. the Roma come from India, and uh, they uh, brought their traditions uh, of of Kali and uh, combined her with the Christian figure of Saint Sarah when they when they got to France. So the, there's another one of those those interesting connections. But it's not one Very of those. Cool. Yeah, it's not one of. I mean, it, it just blew my mind when I found out that's what they call her. <laughs> so, um, so <laughs> there's, sense, there's so. Yeah, three three more shows you've given us, Karen. Well, awesome. uh, I, I I'm through our our question sheet. We're we're getting into the wrap up. Jason, do you, do you have any uh, final questions, thoughts, uh, themes that you want to you want to ask or speak on? Yeah, I think like one of the things that I've been um, that I've been thinking about as well is that like uh, this maybe treads into territory. The, the, here's the trick: is that like I have all these thoughts, but I don't have a ton of research, so it's all just hot takes. Um, this is the hot take show. That's true. Yeah. Um, oh, and uh, you guys are getting the divine presence of my cat right over there. That's, there we uh, that's go. Nice Yay! To see. Um, no. Uh, so, um, it was, whatever I was going there was the the thought about. So, like, I know that uh, uh, for a lot of folks that I that I've had as friends and, and uh, colleagues is that they often find um, uh, church as it's tr generally defined in a like sort of Roman Catholic sense or um, or really religion in general as being uh, distinctly male and distinctly patriarchal, like as a thing about enforcement. Um, and I guess like, again, this kind of goes back to some of my earlier questions, but is, uh, uh, is, is that also kind of an appeal of the divine feminine is a way, like it's, it's, it's sort of an, um, it's a different, if it's a, it's a different offering perhaps to people who might be yearning for a, for a connection, but like are, are nervous about maybe uh, aligning with something that they've actually in, in general, in other parts of their life, moved away from? Yes, absolutely. And um, so our, our parish is named St. Mary Magdalene Parish, and there were a few reasons why we chose that, not the least of which is that we wanted to be a home for those who felt disenfranchised, for those who felt separate from the church of their upbringing. And so we chose that for very important reasons. However, it is still there. And I know that right now, especially, we've been talking to a lot of millennials. And I'll put in a little plug for Monsignor's Bray's, Monsignor Bray's talk at the upcoming um, conclave for the Apostolic Joanite Church. And we've been talking to several millennials. And they're, their experience growing up was very controlled, very helicopter-ish, um, no real choice, no real way to fall down and make mistakes and find that wisdom that Sophia so greatly embodies. But those aspects are there, even in the modern church, they're just hidden. And the church itself was seen as feminine in the Middle Ages especially. And, and of course, the Marys are there, but hidden. And in the chrism, in the oil, I believe is also deeply feminine for that anointing aspect. 
And, and I think it's there if you can find it. And unfortunately, we've lost some of that, especially like with um, the old order of the deaconesses. Hmm. They, um, you know, if, if there was a charge of abuse in a marriage or something like that, it was the deaconesses who, of course, would interview the woman, who would inspect the woman to, for injuries as evidence. And it was also the deaconesses who performed the baptisms on adult women. And of course they helped the women in taking care of their families and in taking care of their communities. And we've lost that a little bit, but I have heard some rumors that um, our, the current Catholic Pope Francis is wanting to bring those deaconesses back for that very reason. Um, because it was that that role is so vital for women in the church and for their families and for their communities. So it would be nice to see that come back. So yes, absolutely. And I think, and of course, the more you make the hidden visible, the more you make the yin yang. So there is that bit of a complication there. But but I do think it's there, and I think it's always been there. It's just been kind of ignored. Yeah. That actually leads me to an, uh, sort of another piece there too, is like, so a lot, we've, we've been talking a lot about the, that hidden quality or the more meditative quality yes. um, and mystical quality, but there is just what you said about the uh, m making the, the invisible visible or, or exploring that and that sense of balance. This might be just the Libra in me, but like um, maybe like what's the, What's the sci-fi, you know, futuristic idea of like what do things look like when there is a more, um, like when there is a, a more a fuller sense of balance, um, c connecting the two, you know, when there's not a a sense of something something having to be hidden and another thing having to be in front. Um, yes. I don't know. It's kind of a speculative question, but like, or maybe a maybe a more direct question would be: What would some benefits be? of a more balanced, like of a fuller balanced approach? Well, and even, even rec the recognition of some of the more pagan roots of Christianity. I mean, we do have the chalice. Um, we don't really have a blade or a wand anymore in modern Christianity. But I think what it would look like is more egalitarian and maybe even a rec, um, a more wider recognition of what those symbols mean because we do have the chalice, we do have the cup and the Eucharist. Um, it is filled with, you know, Christ's blood and water. But if we maybe even acknowledged the more gestative aspects of the cup, of the, of the chalice, of the three days, um, I believe that uh, Jesus spent on the cross, and the more the more gestative aspects of that, because I've always seen the feminine as the vessel, and even when it's an empty vessel, it's full of potential. It's full of possibilities. It's full of the alchemical aspects of growth, mm. and so that's what I would like to see is maybe bringing more awareness to what's already there and making it a bit more egalitarian. Extremely cool. Well, I think that's a, the perfect place to end. So, so thanks so much, Karen. Uh, before we do depart, and you know, just a couple minutes for plugs from all three of us where people can find you and find you online, know more about uh, the, the parish in Denver. Yes, so we um, we do meet in Denver. We have several um, in person and online um, events. The best way to get a hold of us and what's going on is our parish Facebook group, AJC Magdalene, and we've got our schedule up there, our Zoom links up there. We also so on Sundays at uh, 10 a.m. Mountain, we have a bit of a homily discussion group just on Zoom. And then at 1 p.m., we have our in-person mass at um, the Evanston Center in Denver. 
And then we've also been um, broadcasting it on Zoom and also putting the majority of our homilies as videos on the Facebook group. And then we also have a Monday evening discussion as well as an e a Wednesday evening. So a little bit later tonight, a meditation on the Facebook group. And then the third Thursday of every month, we do perform our feminine ceremony. Um, and it hasn't been getting a lot of attention, but I think I need to advertise it more. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was fortunate to, uh, to be a participant in the the ceremony uh, for for Conclave in Denver, and it's it's yes. definitely very powerful, very moving. So check it out online, and if you are in Colorado, uh, of course, all of the programming that Karen mentioned. But if you get a chance to do their uh, divine feminine service, I, I highly recommend it. Hey, talk about Conclave. Uh, it's online this year. So uh, the first time, possibly the last time, uh, it's uh, the HAC's uh, big, it's, it's a mix of a conference, it's a mix of a retreat, it's, it's, it's really nifty. It moves around usually every year, but of course due to COVID, uh, it's, uh, it's all going to be online. So this is a really special chance uh, for you to take it in. So go to joanite.org slash conclave and there's just a whole host of amazing speakers uh, both from within the church, outside of the church, talking about a wide range of topics from spiritual practice to uh, intellectual understandings of modern Gnosticism to a lecture on Jung. It, it, it's really going to be a fantastic time. It's at the end of May, and you can register at joanite.org uh, slash conclave. Uh, for my plugs, um, mylandmeditation.substack.com. Uh, I have some training to do kind of secular, open meditation uh, for everybody. Uh, so what I do is uh, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Montreal time, that's Eastern Standard Time, uh, we do an hour of meditation. It's a mix of, of silent and guided. We've got a great group that comes out for it. And it is uh, free. It's open to everyone, no matter what your spiritual tradition or if you're not spiritual at all because it's in the, the mindfulness movement and uh, that's every Sunday morning so go to mylandmeditation.substack.com uh, and I know some of you listen to this as a podcast so instead of slurring my words that's the word mile <laughs> and end in meditation.substack.com. Um, my uh, parish in Montreal, uh, Holy Grail Parish, is uh, only online right now because of the COVID crisis. So uh, every second Sunday, we do a, um, a meeting in, in the evening. It's usually pretty meditation-based, uh, more specifically, you know, Gnostic, more specifically part of the Joanite tradition, uh, more mystical meditation and some discussion afterwards. Feel free to check that out uh, again because because if you're not in Montreal, uh, once the crisis is over, we are going to go back to doing it in person. So in the meantime, it's open to the entire world. Uh, Jason, do you got any plugs? Uh, not really, actually. It's just at jasonmemmel.com is usually the, the best, best place to find uh, what I'm up to. If my like, links to Instagram and Twitter are on there. And um, yeah, through those, you'll, ba you'll basically see whatever it is that I'm talking about or interested in. Um, uh, maybe one weird plug is that I uh, am on Instagram and I tend to try to post a lot about my coffee uh, as, as just a cozy ritual. So if you're interested in uh, like a, just a small little thing that I do every or every day or almost every day um, to to celebrate a small thing in the day, um, yeah, give that a check. But you okay. can find it all at jasonmemmel.com. Perfect. Everybody uh, check that out. Okay. Well, this is Deacon Jonathan Stewart uh, signing off. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thanks all. Bye.